trying to uh, put together a plan of getting away with murder. And I was going to kill my brother. I kicked him up, and he fell onto those rigs. Some court people came and got me. I stabbed my first man. You don't want to be messing with this kid? I'm here serving a 5 to 20 year sentence. I I'm ready to go now. You wouldn't want to meet Wayne alone at night. He is the most psychopathic a person can be. A true shark among us. Wayne, a pseudonym, scored 40 out of 40 on the hair psychopathy checklist. In this chilling documentary, Wayne dispassionately recounts how he plotted the murder of his own brother. He then plays the role of the reformed convict, a man who has reflected, learned from his mistakes and presents no danger, a man who can be safely released back into society. This is only an act, a predator's camouflage in order to be released to prey on people like you and I again and again and again. Before we start, I should clarify that I'm not diagnosing anyone merely speculating about what could be happening in this and similar situations. Before we analyze Wayne's behavior, let's review the traits assessed by Hare's psychopathy checklist. That's the tool which showed Wayne to be a psychopath. The traits assessed by the revised psychopathy checklist are glib and superficial charm, pathological lying, superficial emotions, poor behavioral control, lack of realistic long-term goals, failure to accept responsibility, revocation of conditional release, large ego, cunning and manipulative, callousness and lack of empathy, sexual promiscuity, impulsivity, many short-term relationships, criminal versatility, prone to boredom, lack of remorse or guilt, parasitic lifestyle, early behavioral issues, irresponsibility, and juvenile delinquency. We must remember that many psychopaths, particularly the more intelligent, can mimic normal behavior and emotions. They do this in pursuit of their goals, accruing power over others, influence, money, and stalking potential victims. In this case, let's see how this predator behaves in pursuit of the freedom necessary to strike again. If you are enjoying this video, and want to let us know you want to see more videos like this, please hit the like button. In this section, Wayne recounts how he planned and executed the murder of his own brother. Note the completely normal rate, rhythm, and tone of his speech. He sounds like someone talking about planning their boring weekly grocery shopping trip, not murder. This lack of emotional reactivity when discussing their crimes is typical for psychopaths. Trying to uh, put together a plan of getting away with murder. And I was gonna kill my brother. I knew that every Sunday I'd jump on his bike and he'd head down the road to join up with some other fellas. And he loved that bike. And he used to tell me, you ever touch my bike, I'll kill you. So this Sunday morning, while he's working, I take his bike. I knew if I provoked it just a little bit more that he would chase me. So I gave him a couple of kicks and took off on a dead run for a tree that was right beside my grandfather's barn. And it went up onto the roof. And on the opposite side of the barn, there were cutter rakes. And sure enough, he chased me up there. And as he uh, topped the edge of that roof, I kicked him off it. And he fell onto those rakes. Some court people came and got me. What a prosaic way to describe the murder of your own flesh and blood. There are few more emotive words in the English language than psychopath, a clinical term for a condition that only recently has begun to be properly defined. It describes a dangerous pattern of behavior which, although it's been recognized for the best part of a century, is little understood. Every decade has produced its own particular brand of psychopaths whose horrific crimes have defied any kind of rational explanation. Recent research into psychopathy in Britain and America 
is encouraging scientists to believe that they're close to discovering the root cause of the condition. Now we can literally look inside the mind of a murderer. We can look inside the brains of psychopaths and begin to see things that nobody else has ever seen before. What the scientists are discovering suggests that psychopaths are born, not made, that their condition is the result of a specific malfunction of the brain. The complexity of psychopathy has made it difficult to treat, but now that could all change. I think the general public would characterize a psychopath as somebody who does really nasty things. And in fact, the public view of the psychopath is that he or she Primarily, he is a serial killer. The general public is not wrong in that respect, but what has happened is that they have ignored the fact that there are, there are tens of thousands of other people out there who are psychopaths but are not serial killers. Psychopaths simply do not experience emotions in the same way that we do. They don't experience empathy in the way that we do. They don't experience love in the way that we do. And because of this, they are more likely to stick a knife in someone to get what they want because they just don't care about the other person. Next, Wayne describes the impact of the first time he stabbed a man. There is no reflection on the circumstances leading up to the event. No remorse, no guilt, no emotional component to the description of the stabbing or its aftermath. There is only a functional assessment that the stabbing communicated something of value about him to others. You don't want to be messing with this kid. He'll stick you. This is common among psychopaths I've assessed. I stabbed my first man. Uh, I uh, stabbed him. Uh, he lived. But it sent out a word, a clear word to the rest of them that uh, you don't want to be messing with this kid. He'll stick you. Psychopaths can sing the lyrics, but they don't respond to the melody, the melody of, of normal human interactions and emotions. There is something missing. He has no compunctions. He kisses or chills without a thought. They are dangerous, without conscience, and all around us. In Britain, it is estimated that one in every 200 of the population is psychopathic. And by far the vast majority are neither criminal nor in prison. But the kind of harm that psychopaths can cause at home and in the workplace is deeply damaging and costly in every sense. We must be concerned about their impact on families when they're out in the community. They move from relationship to relationship. They have multiple children who they abandon. They engage in spousal assault and a whole range of behaviors which are unacceptable. David Cook is a forensic psychologist at the Douglas Inch Center in Glasgow. He's made a close study of psychopaths in prison. They tend to be very versatile in their criminality, so they don't tend to engage in one particular type of crime. They'll engage in a whole variety. So they may engage in violent crime, conning and manipulative crime. They may engage in sex crime, uh, property crime, and so forth. So they, they, they cover the whole range of, of criminal behavior. In the workplace, they often uh, disrupt and destroy the, the good working of uh, the business or an operation because they're interested in what's in it for themselves. I think it's a very important condition and we do need resources put into treatment to see if we can find anything that works. The only psychopaths who are readily available for possible treatment and research purposes are those who are locked up in prison. They're a minority of the prison population, but they're special. There is a growing realization that the range of their crimes, coupled with the disproportionate amount of damage they cause, makes them public enemy number one. The population in which you would find a bigger concentration of psychopaths than anywhere else 
uh, is in amongst convicted criminals, but a majority of people in prison are not psychopaths. Psychopaths are a minority, but a minority who are particularly likely to reoffend. David Thornton is a senior scientist with Her Majesty's Prison Service. He develops treatment programs for serious offenders, and recidivist psychopaths are now a major concern of his. Further criminal behaviour harms the victims of that criminal behaviour. Um, it also um, costs the country a lot of money in terms of police time, in terms of the time of the courts, um, and in terms of what society spends in relation to people who've been hurt by crime. You only have to change the re-offence rates by quite a small amount, and you actually save quite a lot of money if you're thinking of it in purely economic terms. Before you can tackle the high cost of psychopathic crime, first you must reliably identify who are the psychopaths. Recently, this has become easier. The major breakthrough, I think, has been the development of the psychopathy checklist by Robert Hare and his colleagues. And that has allowed uniformity in the diagnostic process. So when a researcher in Canada talks about a psychopath defined by Hare and one in Scotland, talks about psychopaths defined by Hale's criteria, we all know we're talking about the same sort of uh, disorder. In Vancouver, the person who has contributed most to helping everyone get a better handle on psychopathy is Robert Hare. From the start, Hare recognized the central problem of defining a condition about which we know little, other than its symptoms. If you're going to deal with a particular condition called psychopathy in this case, or schizophrenia or any other condition, you've got to make sure that you can record and measure these particular disorders reliably and validly. From the scientific perspective, psychopathy is a combination of characteristics, inferred personality traits and behaviors that hang together. And for this reason, we had to figure out a way to make this, this idea of psychopathy as scientifically valid as possible and we spent the next three, 15 years trying to develop an instrument that would actually do this job, and in effect a measuring tool that was not made out of rubber. The measuring tool that Hare devised is called the Psychopathy Checklist. It's become the industry standard internationally for identifying psychopaths. In a carefully structured interview, an expert using the checklist which defines character traits closely associated with psychopaths, can determine the extent to which someone is or is not psychopathic. Many of these characteristics are not uncommon, but points are awarded out of 40, and a score of 26 or higher is required to identify the true psychopath. Whenever I list the characteristics that define the psychopath, uh, people will say, well, look, I know somebody who's got two or three of those characteristics. Are they psychopaths? And I'll say, of course not. What you've got to do is have a, a cluster, a combination of characteristics that hangs together. In the present climate of the United States, prison therapy programs are no longer fashionable. But Vermont State Penitentiary is an exception. Behind its high security fences, in a special unit, they have some of the most difficult criminals in the country, including psychopaths. This particular unit represents the uncontrollable, the undesirables, the ones that refuse to program, is what they refer to as the most disruptive. I'm here serving a five to 20 year sentence for sexually molestation of four boys the ages of four to 12. Wayne has been here for more than 10 years and perhaps has 10 more to do. He scored 40 on the psychopathy checklist. It's the maximum possible and extremely rare. The authorities here believe that time and money spent trying to reform psychopaths like Wayne is a worthwhile investment. Unfortunately, most recent research shows that changing the traits and behaviours of psychopaths is much more difficult than previously thought. 
the most recent review of psychological interventions for antisocial personality disorder from the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews shows little evidence that any psychological intervention changes antisocial traits or behaviors. I hope that I, the tools that I've learned in this program and other programs like it, um, I can... Head of the therapy program, Tom Powell, knows he's working in relatively uncharted territory, and Hare's checklist is invaluable. Dr. Hare has provided us with uh, some significant advances in understanding in detail the syndrome that is now uh, known as psychopathy. He's validated a scheme that's quite, quite uh, uh, good in terms of looking at a set of, of antisocial behaviors as well as, as uh, interpersonal traits which distinguish these folks. In the next section, when Wayne talks to the prison therapist, Tom Powell, pay attention to the three channels of communication on display. These three channels are the verbal, paraverbal, and nonverbal. The verbal channel refers to the information transmitted by the words we say. This includes not just the content of the words, but also their hermeneutics. The paraverbal channel refers to the information transmitted through the tone, pitch, pacing, and volume of our voices. For an example of this, imagine hearing two people talking in another room. You cannot hear the words they are saying, but the tone, pitch, pacing, and volume can tell you whether they are arguing or not. The nonverbal channel refers to the transmission of information through facial and body position and movements. Verbally, he is the model of calm, studious engagement with the therapy program. He says he focuses on beneficial activities such as reading, writing, keeping to himself and keeping out of trouble. Paraverbally, the rate, rhythm, tone and volume are all appropriate and appear completely normal, but non-verbally, there's a complete locking down of the limbs, those betrayers of true intent and feeling. His right ankle is crossed over his left knee. It is a posture which indicates confidence, but it serves another purpose. It locks the leg in place. It prevents the limb from non-verbally betraying him, from showing what he is really thinking and feeling. His hands are resting over his groin. His hands seem peaceful, but if you look closer, the fingers are intertwined. Those hands are locked in place and protecting a vulnerable region. He is ensuring that neither his hands nor his legs make any subconscious movements to betray what he is really thinking. He is doing everything possible to manage his nonverbal communication in order to sell his narrative to the therapist. Pay particular attention to the relative lack of body movement, eye contact, and decreased blink rate while Wayne talks. The first two are signs of how controlled he is during this section. Decreased blink rate is a well-documented sign of psychopathy in some psychopaths. Decreased blink rate in response to stressful, fear-inducing images or situations tends to occur in highly controlled psychopaths. It is clear that given his score in the hair psychopathy checklist and his behavior on camera so far, that Wayne is highly controlled. What can you tell us about your early years where you grew up? Okay. Uh, well, I'm, uh, I just turned 45, uh, the 23rd of January. Wayne's sessions with Tom Powell, a little more than conversation therapy. For no one yet has any real idea what works in the treatment of psychopaths. But Powell is discovering the complexity of the personalities he's dealing with. Uh, I keep to myself. I do a great deal of studying. I do a great deal of reading. I do a great deal of writing. But Powell is aware of the game being played and can see right through it. Psychopaths can be wondrous in many ways. And one of them is their ability to engage otherwise knowing and well-informed therapists uh, about their, their sincerity and their desire to change. And uh, I have found it very easy to be seduced by the, uh, the tone and the affect and the engagement of a psychopath who with great earnestness tells me that he's finally found the light and has, has seen the error of his ways. The therapists are wonderful. Uh, I learn a great deal from them. Sometimes it can be hard. I suppose that's the way it's supposed to be when you're growing up. I I'm ready to go now. I know that that decision will come from others who have already seen. They've seen my change. Yes.
Wayne's current strategy is a combination of flattery and saying what he thinks they want to hear. He admits that therapy is difficult, but highlights that it is worthwhile. He says it stimulates his personal growth. He recognizes that release will occur only as a result of demonstrable change in behavior over time, seen by others. This is all show. The typical manipulation of the psychopath during review. Always with the manipulation. Always. Note also the use of the hand to emphasize his points. Pay particular attention to the self-referential finger point to emphasize that others have seen change in him. Amusingly, the therapist is now the person sitting there controlling their facial expressions and hand movements. Even when we see through a psychopath's attempted manipulation, it is important to only show them what you want them to see during a session. It could be dangerous to allow subconscious movements to non-verbally communicate to Wayne that we see through him. Wayne might react violently to this realization. In this case, and in front of the cameras, isn't the time to challenge Wayne on his attempted manipulations. One of the things that the medical students with whom I've worked uh, have noted is that they're shocked at how normal psychopaths uh, look and how engaging they are. I do not know one clinician who hasn't at one time been taken by a psychopath. It happens to the best of people. This is very true. As a clinician, once you've shown someone to be a psychopath, you are on guard and much less susceptible to being taken in by them. However, we can't go around doubting everything everyone does. We must be reasonable in both the depth and breadth of our caution and suspicion, or we become ineffective clinicians. Here Wayne, again, attempts to play the role of reformed prisoner who isn't a danger to anyone. Unfortunately for him, he makes enough slips that we can see through him. Watch and see what you spot. At the end of the clip, I'll outline what strikes me most. I, I knew that I had to get in touch with some deeper level of, of interconnection so that I could identify with humanity. We're all born with a conscience. We learn not to touch the stove because it's hot. Until we touch the stove and get burned, then and only then we don't touch the stove again. Compassion and empathy is a learned process. It starts off at a very early age. Wayne's example is very telling. He likens a conscience to learning not to touch a stove because it burned him. It is all about the impact on him, not empathy for others. In actuality, having a conscience is like learning not to touch something because touching it damaged it and that isn't something we want. We must assume that he has thought about how to present the facsimile of a conscience and has rehearsed this line often to make himself appear as reformed as possible. Even still, given his psychopathy, the closest approximation he can make to a conscience when talking to the cameras is that he has learned not to kill or abuse others because he has been hurt through imprisonment when he killed. This isn't a conscience. At best, it is an example of operant conditioning where a conscious voluntary action is avoided in order to avoid an unpleasant consequence. In this case, he has claimed to have learned not to kill in order to avoid being sent to jail again. In reality, it is more likely he has merely decided to be more careful in covering his tracks the next time he kills in order to avoid being sent to jail. Even rehearsed and trying to appear as his most sympathetic, he gets being a decent human being wrong. They are very gifted at being able to convince you um, I'm harmless. I did not do it. There's absolutely no way I'm responsible for this crime. These are very good actors. They can read an audience uh, or an individual uh, as well as any one that I've ever seen. While they appear to be speaking about themselves, they're constantly monitoring the facial expressions, uh, the responses, and they will then uh, tailor what they say to uh, see if they can get the kind of response that they want. And here we'll see Wayne showing us a poster on his wall, which screams, look at how much I'm against anger, how in touch with my feelings I am, how much I value connection and re-engaging with society, 
and idolize peace-loving hippies. Can't you see how much I've changed and how I won't murder and abuse anyone ever again? Note also the number of times he turns to check for reaction. He's reading the crew here, ready to modulate his approach to get the reaction he wants. This checking for reaction and modulation of approach is very common with psychopaths. It is all calculated and manipulative. My idol is John Lennon. And of course, on the other side of the tracks, we have Willie Nelson. He represents uh, freedom in, in different ways. Uh, love, peace, harmony, uh, togetherness, connection with the polar bears, and uh, freedom in general. Culturally, we find some difference between the United Kingdom and North America. Our psychopaths tend to be less overt in their glibness, their superficial charm, and so forth. These things are not so obvious as they are in the North American um, prisoners, for example. We've done studies where Canadian prisoners and Scottish prisoners have been rated by Canadian and Scottish raters, and we can show that the, the um, Canadian prisoners are more extrovert, more glib, more superficial, more charming than our Scottish prisoners, who tend to be a bit doer, as you can see. And of course, the feathers represent freedom, and uh, the leaf represents uh, changing of the times. And uh, there's something, some little thing that I stuck together, and my philosophy is it's our right, and we have a right to cry if we want to. In this next clip, Robert Hare gets to the crux of the matter. Psychopathy is associated with differences in brain development and function. It is unlikely that those scoring highly on the psychopathy checklist can ever overcome these functional differences in brain structure and development. Therefore, it is unlikely they can ever truly learn to develop a conscience and empathy for others. There is some hope for those scoring in the 20s, even if the changes are mostly operant in nature, but for those scoring in the high 30s or even 40 out of 40 like Wayne, it is, as Hare says, like trying to teach the colorblind to see colors. They can understand they exist, but try as they might, they cannot experience them. A lot of people, particularly those who tend to believe in the goodness of, of humanity, say, well, the problem with the psychopath is that uh, he or she was not properly treated as a child and, and uh, actually never learned to be empathetic toward, you know, towards other people and uh, really never learned to become attached or, or bonded with somebody else, a caregiver. And that's the problem, and we can resolve it in adulthood simply by giving them a hug, maybe a musical instrument and a puppy dog, and they're all going to be okay. Give them lots of love and understanding. With a psychopath, I would argue that emotion is like being colorblind uh, for them, and nothing we can do is actually going to instill a sense of empathy. This is really a waste of time. I think that biologically, or neurobiologically, the mechanisms that should impart affect or emotion to one's cognitions and thoughts and attitudes are not working properly in psychopaths. I believe in science. I believe in the study of, of the mind, but it's very complex. I'm not sure if there will be in my lifetime any ground made on that. And so for the time being, we have to look at what we have in regards to forms of prevention. We have to protect people. We have to protect society. And I understand that today. We should, of course, rehabilitate where possible. But the question as to whether or not rehabilitation is always possible is a valid one. The evidence shows there are limits to the capacity of someone like Wayne to change. We would be fools to ignore that evidence. Current therapy programs for psychopaths in prison are not proving very successful. Indeed, the extraordinary fact is that there is a higher incidence of reoffending among those who've received treatment than those who've not. Not only does the treatment not work, it seems to exacerbate the condition. So, people like Wayne are more likely to reoffend after undergoing this therapeutic program. That's a sobering thought. It does, however, point to the difficulty of changing traits and behaviours which occur as a result of significant differences in the functioning of the psychopath's brains. If the portions of the brain which generate emotion and empathy are broken or turned off in psychopaths, how can we expect therapeutic programmes to create positive change? 
Imagine it like having a car with two wheels missing. No matter how well everything else in the car works, it won't go anywhere unless you have two spare wheels. If you don't, then that car won't move. While we don't see every facet of Wayne's psychopathy, the clips selected show the ability of some psychopaths to try to camouflage themselves and appear normal. In reality, they are constantly scanning for how they come across, shaping their narrative and approach to get their desired reaction, manipulating, calming, and reassuring in pursuit of their goal. This goal being to get released into the community where he can stalk his prey again. I hope you found this interesting. I'll finish by providing links to two books about psychopathy in the description below. These are affiliate links, so if you make a purchase, we'll receive a small commission, which we'll use to create more and better content. Please leave any comments or questions in the comments section, and we'll do our best to answer them. This channel is dedicated to exploring crime and psychiatry, more specifically, how mental health interacts with and impacts forensic cases. If you'd like to be notified when we release videos, remember to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Take care and stay safe.